but it's certain in this industry that we have an on-time departure. So. My name is Dave Sumi, and I'm the Acting Regional Administrator for the FAA for the Northwest Mountain Region. The Northwest Mountain Region represents uh, the seven states tucked way up here in the northwest corner of the United States. And I welcome all of you. Thank you for coming tonight to listen to uh, the outcome of the draft environmental assessment and to also give us your thoughts, comments, concerns going forward so we can be certain that they are addressed. This initiative that you've been hearing about tonight and undoubtedly in the news, it's been out there for a couple of years now, we refer to as greener skies over Seattle. It's an initiative that our Next Gen Management Board, and I'll talk about Next Gen in just a moment, adopted as a project and initiative going forward in June of 2010. We started drafting the actual procedures, seeing how they would work, uh, the best possible way to, to lay them out, and then about January of this year, uh, we laid pencils down. We had gotten to the point where it was time to do an environmental assessment on the initiative to see what type of environmental consequences there could be, pro or con, uh, to identify that so we would know exactly what might be happening if we went ahead with this proposed action. Now, I mentioned NextGen. NextGen is a name that we <coughs> use to identify a whole portfolio of systems, technologies, approaches, procedures, processes within the Federal Aviation Administration that is going to allow us to have more precision in the way we control our aircraft, increased efficiencies, and so on and so forth. Like I said, it's a whole portfolio of systems, and what NextGen does is it uses a couple of those technologies to go ahead and put the procedures in effect like we're proposing tonight that you're going to be hearing about. It's, if you will, a local, a very small local application of a very big program across the country. So, let me talk about why we're even doing this, the purpose and need of this project. As I mentioned, one of the primary things we need to do, just with the natural organic growth of aircraft everywhere in the world, in the country, is to have as efficient of a system as we can. And it's more difficult to do it in complex airspace, like we have here in Seattle with the number of operations that we have. As you can imagine, it's a little bit different trying to control aircraft as efficiently, as effectively as we can with the level of activity we have here versus trying to do the same thing in Fairbanks, Alaska. Much more difficult in complex airspace. And one of the things that we're trying to do is to increase, to help us do that, is to increase the flight path predictability and flexibility. Some of the subject matter experts that you're going to hear tonight are controllers that can tell you the importance of being able to accurately predict that this airplane is going to be in this location at a precise point in time at a precise altitude because they're working a whole number of aircraft in that same area at the time. It's also to decrease communications between the controllers and the pilots. Every time there's a communication between a controller and a pilot, there's an opportunity for an error. That they might hear something wrong, they might read it back wrong, it might not get caught. So there's safety implications to congestion on the radio frequencies, and the more you can do to find alternate ways to reduce that is better for the system. And then finally, because much of what we are doing tonight, or proposing and describing to you tonight, uh, is based upon satellite technology, the same type of technology that you use with your GPS in your car, albeit slightly more sophisticated, uh, because it's based on that and not based on having to fly over a precise land-based nav aid, fly to it or away from it, because of that, we have a lot more direct routings that we can use and even curved approaches that we can use with a high degree of accuracy to route these aircraft much more, uh, much more directly. So I mentioned that we uh, adopted this procedure or this project in June of 2010. 
we're in the environmental assessment stage right now, and we want to make certain that we're getting all the comments, uh, that people understand what it is we're trying to do, and that we're getting everyone's comments so they can be incorporated in any consideration going forward. And that's the purpose of the meeting tonight. We met with you in this area. I don't think we were in Ballard in January, but we were up where was Shore, Shoreline. We were up north uh, in January when we were scoping the project. Some of you might have been up there for that. We understood now you know, what the need for the scope was. We went back, we analyzed it, and we're here to report out on that tonight. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bob, who will give you a little background on what his firm does and what he's going to be talking to you tonight on. Thank you, Dave. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Bob Miller. I'm with uh, Harris Miller Miller & Hansen, and uh, we are the uh, firm that is uh, running the, the um, uh, environmental assessment. Uh, it's in the draft stages now, and um, at the uh, conclusion of the comment period, which uh, I'll talk about, uh, we'll be producing a final uh, environmental assessment, and it will be that document upon which um, FAA makes a judgment as to whether or not to uh, go ahead and adopt uh, what's being proposed or not. Um, and before I, I get started, I just want to make sure that everybody who um, uh, came in and parked in the parking lot here got the message that if you're behind the gate, it locks automatically at 8 o'clock and nobody here can unlock it. So uh, just be aware of that as a, as a timeline uh, if you're in the, in the library parking. So just want everybody here. Um, okay. Uh, what, uh, what our job is, is to evaluate uh, various um, environmental resources. And um, before I, I get into that, I want to describe the procedures that uh, many of you who are at the boards have already heard, but I want to go make sure that everybody's heard a, a, a version of the same thing. Um, what is being proposed is uh, two new standard arrival procedures, one that comes in from the northwest uh, and one that comes in from the southwest. And attached to those procedures are uh, 24 uh, uh, what, are what are called uh, required navigational performance procedures, which are further refinements of um, the approach into uh, Seattle, either from the northwest or the southwest, taking the aircraft all the way to the runway uh, on these uh, precise paths using this GPS technology. Um, the, uh, the other major element of the, the proposed uh, action here is that these arrival procedures uh, utilize optimized profile descents, OPDs. And um, what is um, beneficial uh, about those uh, procedures and different from today's arrival procedures is that beginning at a, an altitude of about 31 to 35,000 feet in the air, quite a distance out from Seattle, uh, the aircraft uh, can go into a, a flight idle uh, thrust condition, pilot pulls back the power, and um, uh, it's not quite like thinking of coasting, but the aircraft is able to maintain a constant descent from that altitude, almost seven miles up, all the way to the runway, with very little change in power. And the difference there uh, to, to a standard approach is that aircraft uh, uh, typically and nowadays uh, come in, they begin a descent. There are times when to avoid uh, uh, departing traffic or other traffic conflicts, they have to level off. And every time that level off occurs, the, uh, the pilot adds power to maintain the airspeed until there's further clearance to descend. Every one of those additional clearances and level offs includes a radio transmission um, that, that uh, can be eliminated with a, an optimized profile descent. And, uh, and in the process of this uh, reduced power descent, uh, there's reduced noise. It's quite a distance from the airport when that occurs, but uh, it's, it's a benefit that it, uh, affects people uh, in the surrounding area as the aircraft come into land. Um, let me uh, go ahead and talk about uh, what the procedure, what the proposed procedures do not include, because I think it's very important to understand that. Um, there are no uh, arrival procedures that are being discussed that affect any airplanes coming in from the east, either from the uh, northeast corner post or the southeast corner post. Those of you, uh, those of you who have heard that term, corner post, um, uh, know that the aircraft uh, coming into Seattle come from basically four different areas. 
uh, uh, locations in the, uh, those four quadrants. And nothing coming in from the eastern uh, part of the country is being affected by this. Also, the aircraft that depart Seattle, no proposed changes are, are uh, occurring for those aircraft at all. So if you hear a departure aircraft now, it's going to sound like a departure aircraft for the proposed action. Do you have a map that shows what the east, like, well, if, if, if you talk to folks at the boards after we're done, and I have some other pictures that I'll show you. I'm going to go through these procedures specifically. Um, also, no new procedures for any of the other airports in the vicinity. We're not talking about a proposed change to arrivals into Boeing Field or to Payne Field. And there's nothing at all that's going to happen on the airport itself as a result of this project. We're talking simply about flight procedures, all between uh, the... the uh, uh, the uh, pilots of the aircraft and the satellite system and the interaction of uh, the aircraft with the ground controllers uh, taking the advantage of this satellite system. So what, is, what are aircraft doing now? And uh, again, I want to uh, cover uh, uh, a fairly detailed picture that shows the complexity of this airspace. Uh, first, let me mention that um, the airport operates in either south flow or north flow. If it's in south flow, the airplanes are coming in uh, from the north uh, or the south, but they have to circle around and, and land in a southerly direction from here towards uh, uh, Seattle Sea SeaTac Airport to the south of us. Um, north flow is when the wind shifts around and aircraft are uh, have to go south of the airport and land to the north. Uh, so the, the landing uh, process all takes place south of here. Further, let me show what these two pictures are showing. Um, reds are arrivals, uh, greens are departures. This represents together a collection of about 71,000 different flights taken from a sample of radar data one week per month in uh, the year 2011 to represent the existing situation. So let me start over here and point out that um, uh, here's a, here's a, a waypoint, so-called, one of these navigational points where aircraft are arriving in uh, from the northwest. And in south flow, they're, here's Seattle Airport, and they're trying to land from north to south. So the aircraft come in here, and uh, with radar controllers uh, giving them uh, vectors to guide the aircraft, the aircraft come in here, line up with it to the runways, and, uh, and land to the south. If they're coming in from the southwest, they're coming up to uh, waypoints that are here and here, follow a procedure in. And in this case, here's where the aircraft go on to a, using a controller uh, directed instructions, go on to what's called the downwind leg. They're flying parallel to the airport, come up north and turn around and, and land to the south. Does that make sense? When we talk about north flow, um, the, uh, now we're talking about aircraft that start here for their landing and land to the, land to the north. Uh, coming in from the northwest. They come down here. Now they enter the downwind on a radar-controlled uh, vector, make a turn inbound and land to, the, land to the north. And coming in from the southwest, come up to the same point. They come here. They're given radar vectors off of, the, the, uh, off of this waypoint and land up, uh, line up with the runways and, and land to the north. Now I show you this because it's an illustration of how complex the airspace is. You see airplanes in a huge area around the airport, and, and the, the pattern changes depending on whether the traffic is flowing to the north or to the south. Um, what I want to do now is talk about the procedures, and I want to show you what um, the, uh, if we, if we, if you will, collapse these pictures and show the density of traffic, uh, not just one, one line for every airplane, but where are those lines overlapping the most. On the next set of pictures, now, uh, let me start off by saying these lighter blue lines are the individual radar traces, but as soon as they uh, start concentrating over a particular area, then uh, the color changes and yellow incre shows increasing concentration, increasing density of traffic, uh, red increasing further. So you see the concentration of traffic along a downwind here uh, as they come out, up from the southwest, fly the downwind, and. Uh, get turned on to final approach where it's uh, it's red showing a high concentration of the traffic as the aircraft land. Excuse me, so that's the sound up there? Don't answer. 
let, let me try to get to this, and if you have a question, uh, 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 please, I'd like to go and, and uh, ask, have you ask that afterwards. But we're talking about an area that's about 30 miles from here. Puget Sound is, uh, is shown in the map in here. What's going to happen in the future is that if we look at aircraft coming in from the northwest, they're still going to be um, coming in on this from this uh, uh, waypoint, this navigational point. Um, aircraft currently, as you see from the light blue radar traces, are peeled off of here and they line up uh, with the runways. Much of that traffic in the future is going to be on a new arrival procedure shown by this red line here that comes in and lines up uh, on kind of a, a, a turn, a, making a, a, a knee bend, a dog leg, and lining up with the procedure uh, with the ends of the runways to land to the south. So much of the traffic that's in here now is going to be shifted over to, the, to this new arrival. These dotted lines show areas where not necessarily every aircraft is going to be able to follow that precise path uh, and there may be times when traffic interferes with, the, with an operation that is coming in to land on this flight procedure. So there still will be opportunities and, and flexibility for a controller to pull an aircraft off of the arrival for safety reasons uh, or for getting uh, adequate separation from an airplane in front of it. Um, so there, there, some of this uh, traffic that is uh, coming in uh, here uh, is, is going to be shifted a little bit to the north as well. But most of that traffic is going to be coming in on this uh, this new red line if it's landing to the to the um, uh, to the south. Um, if I uh, look at the next uh, pair of pictures, um, if we look at the southwest now, aircraft uh, coming in from that direction hit this waypoint. Now here's the this blue line is the existing procedure. The procedure ends there, and these radar vectors take the aircraft up here, and they make a turn inbound. Uh, to, uh, to land to the south. And again, this is all radar vectored in here, and those turns are, are vectored. In the new uh, proposed procedure, uh, this whole, uh, this, this uh, point, this waypoint is moved over, and the, the traffic is coming in in a more direct uh, path, and, and instead of ending at this location, where, where the, the, the current procedure ends, uh, it's going to, there's going to be an extension along the downwind so that the concentration of traffic, there would be less dispersion along this, this area here. This is uh, over Vashon Island. Uh, there will be less dispersion, and as the aircraft come up to this point, they'll either be able to make a curved approach uh, coming in. This is designed to come in over Elliott Bay. Um, or there, it will continue on to, uh, with radar vectors to join the, uh, the instrument approach to land to the south. Um, next, uh, next pair. Let me now talk about that. All of that is with landings uh, taking place to the south. Let me now shift and uh, look at what's happened when uh, aircraft, when the runways shift and aircraft have to land to the north. Again, the existing procedure <coughs> is here. Um, the the traffic is concentrated, but it's it, these aircraft right now are able to fly this procedure with great precision, and so there's actually some some red and yellow underneath this blue line. As soon as the procedure ends at this point, they're given the radar vectors and you see the dispersed tracks. And those aircraft are brought down and turn on to the final approach and land. When uh, in the new proposed procedure, they come in from the same waypoint up here, same location as over here, um, and they are brought down the same path, but instead of that procedure ending, there's a new downwind leg where it, it adds uh, a precision along this flight path, again over Vashon Island. There, there is a curved approach uh, that comes in over Commencement Bay and uh, up to land uh, to Seattle to the north. And again, there's these dotted lines that show places where the controllers have the flexibility to pull the aircraft off of that uh, procedure uh, to, if they need to get separation. Um, Okay. Um, if we uh, if we look at um, aircraft arriving from the southwest uh, instead of from the northwest, uh, the aircraft are peeled off uh, uh, it, as uh, from the uh, location up here. They're peeled off by radar vectors. Again, uh, radio contact with the pilot and communications with the controllers. They're vectored over here and lined up to to land directly um, 
uh, to the north. With the new procedure, uh, the aircraft are uh, brought further to the east. Uh, they follow a path that goes up this direction, uh, all with the using GPS technology. They join um, the uh, arrival stream uh, that's landing to the north, and the dotted lines indicating radar vectors here, when uh, necessary, will pull aircraft off of that procedure. The idea is that these new procedures, the ones that are shown in red, will get used initially uh, by a um, relatively small percentage of the traffic here, about uh, somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of the existing um, aircraft are equipped and the, and the pilots have to be certified to fly these procedures. About 50 to 60 percent of the traffic currently is uh, certified to make these kinds of approaches. And that number will go up with two things happening. As more airlines convert uh, <coughs> to um, the GPS technology and um, as more newer aircraft come into the fleet that are equipped to have this, uh, these instruments on board, uh, that number will increase, uh, ultimately potentially getting up to into the 90% uh, range. How far out is that final approach fix from the set up from the from the, uh, end I, of the runway? Could I ask you to, to, to ask that later? This is this is a standard approach uh, when the aircraft are on this arrival. Uh, they're on a three degree glide slope and, uh, and coming into land. Um, so right. you're, you're not taking questions, is what I'm you're not, saying? Right. Uh, there will be people who can answer these individual questions. So this is Remember everything you say verbatim, and then we'll remember our questions, and then we'll find the right person right. to ask. Well, and, and please, um, also, I'll talk about your comments, submitting comments uh, at, the, at the conclusion of this as well. I think we're just trying to get clarification so we understand what you're actually telling us. Yeah, yeah, it's just going over our heads, you know? Well, then, then when I'm done, there'll be time afterwards to go and talk to others at the boards and, and ask, ask very specific questions there. Perhaps one so, clarification question which would help people, or maybe you could actually answer this, is are you actually talking about continuous descent approaches here? Because when you just said that the approach is on a three-degree glide slope, that implies the aircraft is not under no power. Could you clarify that? Because that's a contradiction with what you said earlier. No, it's not a contradiction. What, what I, I will answer that, but this is the last one I'm going to take. Um, the optimized profile descents basically begin at very high altitude, flying a three-degree glide slope all the way from that altitude to the end. It's not without power. The aircraft is operating at flight idle to maintain that glide slope. It is not pulled back all the way to, to total idle. The aircraft has to have power to keep that glide slope. And these procedures are designed so that when they hit the existing glide slope, they continue that three degree de descent to the runway. This is not a question, it's just a statement for you and the FAA people in the room. Since you are all paid by us, mm -hmm. you might want to think about changing the format of this in the future. So the Amen. <laughs> Let me, I'm going to finish, and, and again, I'll say that there will be people who can answer these questions at the boards. What I want to talk about is the fact that in the environmental assessment that we're doing, there we are following the National Environmental Policy Act um, that uh, dictates how uh, uh, these uh, studies are, are uh, conducted. And it talks about the, the environmental resource categories that, uh, that must be addressed. And the FAA has a, uh, an implementing order, FAA Order 1051E, uh, that identifies the 18 categories of, of um, uh, environmental resources that need to be looked at. And while uh, not all 18 are listed here, some that are not listed include such things as uh, wild and scenic rivers. And there are no wild and scenic rivers that are affected by this. Uh, there are no coastal barrier reefs that are affected by this. So uh, any uh, one of these resource categories that had a potential for being affected is, is uh, listed here and, and is examined in the, in the document. And noise, because anytime you talk about flight procedures, that's one of the most uh, uh, the resource category of greatest concern probably is to many of you here. Um, I'm going to spend time talking about the results of the noise uh, and how that analysis was done. 
All right. Um, I mentioned that the FAA has an implementing order, 1051E. That, uh, that order uh, dictates the noise metric that we use in, in uh, evaluating the, the exposure. Um, it discusses uh, the model that we uh, are required to use whenever we're talking about an airspace environment where, we're, where aircraft are at, um, uh, at least the 3,000 feet or above, or if there are multiple airports involved. Um, and it, it addresses the, the requirement that we uh, identify changes in between a proposed action and, um, and no action at all. Uh, it also identifies uh, levels of reportable change that we have to, to uh, provide as part of this document. Well, we use um, the, uh, the NEARS uh, noise model uh, for computing this. This is an airspace um, uh, model. And it uh, has a, an additional new benefit where uh, using the same operational information that's used to compute noise, it also uh, computes fuel burn. So we can look at how the fuel burn changes uh, with, the, uh, with the proposed procedures as well. And uh, to make the comparisons that are required by this order, uh, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't produce noise contours, which many of you may have seen from other airport noise studies. Um, but what we do is we, we calculate the values at individual uh, census points, as well as uh, we set up a, a uniform grid uh, uh, across an, an entire study area of about 3,200 square miles. And uh, that uniform grid is to capture uh, values of noise exposure for example, in park areas or places where people don't necessarily live, but which allows us to, to say something about the change in noise. So about uh, a little over 40,000 of these points are places where people live, the so-called uh, population centroids. The other uh, 15,000 or so at these uh, at this uniform grid or some noise sensitive sites. All right. Um, now, I say we don't uh, compute contours, but for those of you who have seen airport noise studies, they look a lot like it. And the reason they do is because the density of the points in heavily populated areas is very uh, close. And um, the, a typical airport noise study, at, uh, at, at, and ones that are done here at, at Seattle, uh, start at values of, of the, uh, the day-night average sound level. Um, that's the measure, metric that's required. It's a measure of exposure during a 24-hour period. And anything that happens between 10 o'clock at night and 7 o'clock in the morning is penalized um, as if it uh, were creating the same amount of noise as 10 uh, other operations. It has a penalty associated with it to, to emphasize the fact that it's quieter at night and therefore it's more intrusive. Well. Uh, the 65, values of 65 uh, and above are in this kind of salmon colored area here, and again, it shows up better on some of these, uh, the graphics that we have. But what we're doing is we're looking at values that are as low as 45 um, uh, decibels using this day night average sound level, and that's the line green color shown here, and going all the way up in this area. Um, those values are 20 decibels less in terms of exposure than the kinds of things that you've seen at, at, at any of the airport studies that have been uh, uh, produced in this area. Um, and these are in five decibel bands. So this is 45 to 50, and then the darker green is uh, 50 to 55, the blue is 55 to 60, 60 to 65, and then again, here's where the normal uh, airport noise study would show is 65 uh, and above. Well, this is with the no action using this NEARS model. The proposed action, for all intents and purposes, most of you probably can't see any differences, and it's very hard. You can't see well. anything, really. No. So I'm going to point out a few things. Um, one is that if you look up here in uh, uh, the northern boundary of King County, uh, the boundary of the 45 uh, count values uh, where the noise is computed is up very near the uh, county boundary. Here it's receded a little bit. And what that suggests is when you compare those two areas, that there's a slight decrease as a result of the proposed action. Now, we recognize that these are difficult to see and, and to, to compare, and I'm not trying to say that they are, and you should be able to see them. So what we did was to try to elucidate a little bit more and zoom in 
and show places where there were increases in noise and decreases in noise as a result of the proposed action. And those increases and decreases we've categorized in different increments to, to show relative change. And if we look at the left side of the, uh, of the picture here, anything that's in a green color is a decrease in noise as a result of the change. Anything that's in, um, and it's over here as well, anything that's in kind of the salmon color is an increase as a result of this. That's great. Some increases More noise. Here. More noise. And the, that's what we want. And the change that we're showing in this entire picture is anywhere where the noise is 45 decibels or above, the exposure change is from, uh, from 0.1 decibels to 1.5 decibels using this day-night average sound level. The, the values that are on the order of the, the values that are on the order of a, a few tenths of a decibel are going to be uh, <coughs> essentially undetectable by you. It's it's a very very small change in exposure. So what did you so, Because we computed this to a very low level. In so, fact, down to a thousandth of a decibel, which so nobody this is could more, hear. More noise, though. There's more the, noise, yes. and it's also technical. There's. There's areas of uh, and we, decreasing and we don't noise have in green, and there's areas of increasing noise mm -hmm. in yes. the salmon yes. color. Which and what is, number is this in your report? And what is causing this is we what I've done is to show the procedures that are causing these increases and decreases and where they are, and they they are zoomed in from figures that are taken from the document. And so, for example, Elliott Bay is in this area here. And the, a procedure that uh, has aircraft coming up from the north on the downwind and a curved approach in over the water to line up with the runways. Here's the area where the runways stand here. Uh, there's traffic on this that's causing this increase over here. Um, there's also some traffic that comes in from the northwest and uh, comes into Elliott Bay. And again, that traffic is, uh, is following these new procedures with their pro uh, optimized profile descents. And, and that's, that's creating this impact and, and uh, exposure, increase in exposure in this area. There's also the, this uh, new procedure that I mentioned, a dog lake that's coming in at this angle to line up with the runways, and that's creating the increased exposure that occurs in here. I want to point out that these values, these changes in noise, if they're on the order of a few tenths, you are not going to be able to detect those differences, but we're reporting them but because because we thought it was informative. If we use the numbers that, um, that are uh, required as a part of the, if we use the numbers that are required to be reported under FAA criteria, these figures would be totally blank. There are, there are no places where there is significant impact. There are no places where the noise is changing in large amounts. So you're saying it's and, not going to change. It's going to be the same. And places where the noise um, increases on the order of one to one and a half dB, those areas may be detectable. Mm. They, those are places where you may notice a difference, but they're not, uh, they're not considered significant increases or decreases, for that matter, for, for in the places where the noise is going down. Why are they increasing? I don't understand. I just explained the, the traffic that was coming in over um, the two so flight tracks where it's happening. So there's more planes? Yeah. Because yeah. 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 they're all concentrated. Is why yeah. there's, there's, what you didn't explain is why there's an increase in, in noise when you just said the traffic is coming in at flight idle, and right now traffic is coming across those routes, not at flight idle. So please explain why there's an increase in noise. Yeah, Should be yeah I don't get Fact, it. Factors that affect the noise exposure, this, this noise exposure metric, include the noise of every individual aircraft and the number of times that those aircraft are producing noise or the number of number of operations that are producing noise. Even if nothing were to happen here, over time the noise is going to increase because there's a forecast increase in the amount of traffic coming into Seattle. So what we're trying to do is show differences between what would happen if nothing is done and what would happen if the proposed action is done. And by and large, those changes are quite small. That is my, my message. So and I know that a number of you live, uh, you know, are from the north. We held a public meeting down in Federal Way, and this shows the same kind of a display 
of um, places where in green the noise decreases uh, over in these areas and places where the noise increases as a result, for example, of the new of the aircraft coming in on this new arrival procedure here, lining up. So there's an increase in, in traffic here. Um, and uh, there's so an uh, increase, uh, increase in noise in this area as a result of traffic coming in over the uh, over uh, Commencement Bay. When we look at the entire study area, the 3,200 square miles, and find and look at every place where the noise is greater than 45 decibels, 45 dNL, using this metric. In 2014, the year in which uh, the, the first full year of, of, of potential implementation of these measures, what we see in that entire area, the entire you know 40 some thousand points where people live, and the additional um, uh, 15,000 points in this uniform grid, the greatest change, the greatest increase we see at any of those points is 0.9 decibel whenever the noise is above 45. So the similar level of decrease, a minus 0.8 dB decrease at any of those locations. So we're not talking about changes that are large in either direction. When we count the population above 45 dNL, where we're experiencing any sort of increase at all, greater than 0.1 decibels, about 120,000 people will experience an increase. Uh, 278,000, approximately, will experience a decrease. Both of these numbers, again, are relatively small in terms of um, the changes, but we're showing Not the, the increase, we're showing so we're showing the places where the, where there will be changes. If we were to use the uh, the, the FAA criteria that are that we are, are required to use in, in looking at reportable numbers of, of changes in exposure, there are uh, zero people exposed to a change of greater than one and a half dB. We already said that the greatest change over here is only 0.9. There are zero people that are exposed to a change in noise of greater than 3 decibels in a range of 60 to 65. And there are zero people exposed to a change of 5 decibels from 45 to 65 dB or greater. So we're looking at a more refined set of uh, differences between, um, between the proposed action and no action than is required in terms of the, the criteria uh, in, in this uh, FAA order. Part of um, what we think is important to recognize is that um, there are just under 400 uh, people who are, we refer to it as newly exposed to a value of 65 decibels or above. And um, the, the reason we're saying that is because uh, land use compatibility is designed around a, 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 in the airport noise environment is designed around a, 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 a sound exposure level, a, a day night average sound level of 65 decibels or above. Now, what this footnote down here says is that there are only two out of that some 40,000 populated points that are newly exposed in 2014. Only one point in each of 2018 and 2023, two future years that we looked at. And the magnitude of those changes at those two locations, in 2014 and 2018, the increase is 0.1 decibels, meaning that the noise without this action was at 64.9, and with this action went to 65. And we're counting those people in, this, in that number there. In 2023, the increase is 2 tenths of a decibel, meaning that the noise in 2023 at one location is projected to go from 64.8 to 65.0. How's that decibel so for one plane, or is it for the constant? No, it's for, it's for exposure. It's using this it's measure of exposure uh, that represents the total amount of traffic uh, in and out during an average. And these are just estimates. They're compute, these, all of these numbers are computed values using the nearest uh, 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 program, which is used for these airspace evaluations. Does so, it use sound the, monitors? No, it's it the measurements. The measurements that uh, or the the calculations here are based on a database of noise and performance information that is uh, a, a standard within the uh, the, the uh, FAA. Also used it, there's military aircraft that are included in this, and they uh, this database of information 
is uh, relates the noise level of the aircraft to different thrust conditions, different distances from the aircraft, so that the model is computing the noise at these 55,000 pieces, at places, not the not um, noise measurements. So it doesn't account the, for the topography of the land or any yes, of the it other does. realities. Yes, it does. It includes terrain in the calculations, not uh, not uh, uh, the shadowing, but terrain is included here. What I'm going to uh, just finish with is that um, when I mentioned that uh, fuel burn is, is, a, is also something that comes out of the NEARS model. And when we look at the, the total airport uh, uh, set of operations, these new procedures uh, uh, re do result in uh, some reduction in fuel burn and a corresponding reduction in the carbon footprint of the airport. It's only on the order of 1% or so for any of the three study years that we looked at. But uh, what's also not shown here is that if you look at some of these individual flight tracks where the aircraft particularly are coming in on these optimized profile descents when the power can be reduced and when there's a fair number of, tra of operations following that, um, that uh, the set of those uh, flight tracks, then we found individual reductions along those flight paths that are on the order of 20, 25, even 30 percent savings in fuel. And that's and that those reductions are, if you will, somewhat masked by the fact that we I said at the beginning we're not talking about any changes in departures. So all the fuel burn from departures is unchanged by this. Anything coming from the east is unchanged. So the fuel burn from any of the operations coming in from the east is, is included in this total. So it kind of masks the benefits of the of, of the procedures from the northwest and the southwest. Finally, I want to mention the, the comment process here. Um, a, a number of you, I'm sure, have seen the Greener Skies EA uh, website. Uh, the uh, draft document has been available on that since the 7th of uh, August. There's a hard copy in this library as well. Um, we started when, as soon as that document was released to enter a comment period. That comment period runs until September 14th. And uh, we're, we're in the middle of this and trying to provide some information to help you come up with your own set of comments to submit to us so that we can take a look at those and we, we are going to be responding to every one of those comments directly in the final uh, environmental assessment. Those can be also uh, submitted uh, orally or written. And in the back of the room, uh, we have a court reporter if you'd like to make an oral statement. We ask that because there's enough of you here to keep your comments limited to you know, one to two minutes, and if it turns out that there's some time left over, you can go back again. But we want to give everybody a chance if you want to make an oral statement. If you want to make a written statement, you can write as long as you want, and you can submit them either tonight or you can turn them in by, um, by mail to Augustine Moses, uh, who's here in the back of the room. Uh, but you can mail it, or uh, you can go to this um, uh, website and you can submit the comments electronically. So we have different modes of being able to, to provide comments on the document.